turn to somebody or a couple people near you and tell them what is your favorite kind of apple. There are lots of kinds of apples out there. So what's your favorite variety or flavor kind of apple? Okay? Okay, so did you get a chance to speak your apple variety? Um, Fuji? Ooh, yeah, popular. Uh, Granny Smith? Ooh, nice. Strong taste buds there. Uh, what others? Brayburn. I'm with you. Brayburn. Golden Delicious? Gala. Ambrosia? Macintosh? Golden Delicious? Red Delicious? Red Delicious. Caramel Apple. <laughs> It was peaceful. It was good. But how quickly things change. 
Two chapters later, the next story later, sin happens and things dramatically change. Um, that's what we call sin and we need to talk about sin. And I think we largely need to talk about it because sin is a huge deal. But, at least the messages I hear and the messages that, that, that I get are that sin is not a big deal. You know, you, you watch TV, you read things online, you listen to advertising and watch things that are printed. I mean, the prevailing message seems to be everything is fine. You know, whatever you do, it's okay for you. Whatever I do, good for me. Whatever makes you feel right, you go ahead and do that. Whatever makes you feel satisfied, just go ahead. But the Bible's message is not that. The Bible's message is not that we are okay and that everything is fine and that everything we do is okay. The Bible's message is that we are sinners and we are in deep need of a Savior. So we need to know, we need to realize, and I think we need to live more with the mindset that, that sin is a big deal. And if it's a big deal, then we need a big way to deal with it. So we're going to look at sin uh, from Genesis chapter 3. Uh, before we do, somebody smart once said uh, this, we can only understand the depth of God loving us when we understand the enormity of God forgiving us. And we can only understand the enormity of God forgiving us when we understand the severity of our sin against God. In other words, God loves us. And we only get that when we feel how much God's forgiven us. But we only know how much God's forgiven us when we feel, when we feel and understand how much we need it because of our sin. So Genesis chapter 3. This is in your bulletin or it's up on the screen. And this is a portion of the lengthy story. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. So what sin? The most common word in, in the Old Testament for sin is a word that means to miss the point. As if God has a point or a thing, and we miss it. And it, it all has to do with actions or behaviors or things that we do that just miss that point. It, it, it could be anything. It could be not being generous. It could be failing to notice somebody who is in need. It could be acting in a rude way. I mean, it could be anything that just misses the point that God has. In the New Testament, the most widely used word for sin is a word that means to miss the mark. So very similar, but it's to miss that mark. As if God has placed a mark out there, an intention for how we live, and we just miss it. And again, this, this has to do with actions or habits or lifestyles of any kind that miss the mark that God has laid out there. So missing the right point, missing the mark, not doing, not living the way that God created us to live. Um, it could be anything, an attitude, an action, a behavior, a habit, anything. Adam and Eve missed the mark and missed the point that God had laid out for them. Everything was good. God laid out a limit and they missed that limit and they missed that point. Because instead what they wanted is what they wanted. And they decided that instead of what God laid out for them, they were going to do what they wanted. And they didn't believe that God had the best in mind for them. So they wanted another way. And I think this is so huge, because this, this, I think, describes why sin is such a big deal. And it's such a big deal because sin is not just doing something wrong. Sin is missing God's best for us. It's not about just missing that mark and not doing that thing. It's that God has laid that out for us, and we miss the best that God has for us. I mean, imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve. I mean, they were the only people 
in the most idyllic, new, brand new place. Everything was new. It's like, a, it's like when you buy a new home and you have that new home smell. Or you walk into a new home. Or you buy a new car and you have that new car smell. I mean, I think there must have been a new earth smell. That people say, this is untainted. Nothing's dirty. The colors are rich. This is all fresh and new and good and perfect. And they were the only ones there. And God said, you are free to roam anywhere, to do anything except this one thing. And there was one limit and one limit only. And they missed that one limit. And God created that limit because God has a best for them. And God had a best that he wanted for their lives. And so when God set up this relationship with them, it was a relationship that has a limit. God has limits in our relationship, and God wants that for us too. God wants the best for us, and so there are going to be limits, because our relationship with God is on God's terms. That's how God set us up too. God has terms for our relationships. That's why God gives us rules and limits and things, to guard them, so that we can have the best of what God created for us. And when we sin, we break those limits. We ruin them. And the problem isn't just that we've done something wrong, it's that we've missed this best thing that's out there for us, that God made. There were only a handful of times that I remember uh, blatantly lying to my mother, but I'm sure there were many, but there were only several that I remember. One was when I was in high school, and it was during finals week. I was studying a lot. I was studying with friends, I was studying at school, I was studying on my own, I was studying at school, after school, at friends' houses, studying a lot. And so I told my mom one evening that I was going to another study group, which was very normal. And so I said goodbye to her and said I was on my way to a study group. Of course, I wasn't going to a study group, I was going to hang out with some people that she didn't want me to hang out with, and I knew that. So I told her I was going to a study group. Well, the whole time I was there, a couple hours, it was eating me inside. And so when I came home, I confessed. And I said, well, I did not go to a study group. I went and I hung out with these people, and I'm sorry. And I thought that fessing up and being genuine, she would have some sort of a response. <laughs> like, you know what, it's okay, because you were honest. Or, thank you for telling me. Thank you for being mature. Go ahead and go on with your evening. Did she say that? No, she did not. She actually didn't say anything. She just looked sad. And she hung her head, and she didn't give me any instruction. She was just silent. And I realized it wasn't because I did something wrong. It was because I wasn't being the son she raised me to be. She wanted the best for me. And that was not the best. And I, I, that's sin. It's just missing this best thing that God has for us. That God longs for us to have. And ways for God, that God longs for us to live. No wonder if Adam and Eve got grounded. Because I got grounded that night. And they got grounded, but they got grounded eternally. And we're part of their family, so we sort of get grounded too. The Apostle Paul describes how this link happens between Adam and Eve sinning and us inheriting this, and how this works. He said in the book of Romans, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. And the story of Adam and Eve sinning is more than just a story of a sin. It's a story of sin starting. It's a trend starting. It, that's why we call it the original sin. It was the first. It was the original one. And there are a whole lot of them after that. It was just starting this course of sin. And it continues. And it's bound to continue. And I think that's one of the other big things about sin. That sin is not a temporary setback. Sin is a permanent condition. It's not just this one-off thing that happens and then we move on. It is a permanent condition. I recently finished reading a book called Lost Moon. Uh, it's the, one of the stories of the Apollo 13 mission. 
and it was written by uh, Jim Lovell, one of the astronauts on that mission, and, and somebody else. And it's a fascinating book, but one of the things that just caught my attention uh, was a simple detail in there, and it was the sheer speed of the spacecraft. And when they were traveling uh, out and around the moon to people come back to Earth, they were traveling at about 4,000 miles per hour. Which I still can't fathom, but they were traveling at 4,000 miles per hour. And of course they couldn't feel traveling that fast, there's no gravity, so they couldn't feel it. But they were traveling 4,000 miles per hour. And they described that as the moon let go, the moon's gravity let go and Earth started to pull them toward the Earth, they increased speed to over 7,000 miles per hour. Which, you know, how do you, how do you imagine 7,000 miles per hour? So they're, they're traveling at this speed, and, and the, the people at Mission Control in Houston are calculating where and when they're going to land. And so they had to, at several points, make a few course adjustments by firing their, little, their very small rockets for very short amounts of time so they wouldn't miss the Earth but they'd actually land in the perfect spot at the right time. And all they had to do was these like four second bursts of these tiny engines to move from completely missing the Earth to actually hitting the exact right spot. And for them it only took those little bursts to adjust to the right place. And how easy it is for us to miss what God has in store because this is just this permanent condition that we're in. We have to avoid thinking that sin is just this temporary setback, this temporary one-off thing that happens. This is a permanent condition. And Paul, I think, describes this well. He said, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And we can love God with all of ourselves, and we can be the most passionate, most faithful person but sin will still live in us. It's just this permanent condition because it's who we are. And that leads to the third huge deal about sin, that sin is not the only way, but God makes a better way. In fact, one of the things I love most about the Bible, and I'm loving most about reading through the Bible this year, is that the whole Bible is the story of God continually, time after time, making another new way. Because it wasn't just one way that God made. God decided to keep on making different ways. Laws, people, leaders, um, poems, trends, songs, saviors, the Holy Spirit. I mean, you name them. God is constantly trying to give us new ways to overcome this sin condition. God always makes a better way. So back to the serpent and Eve and the fruit tree. Uh, the serpent made sin look really good. Really appealing. It didn't, it didn't look like sin at all, and eating that fruit didn't look like missing what God had in store. It looked like all the pleasure of what God had in store. So Eve gave in, and she sinned. Now, what do you think? Did Eve have another way? Did she have another choice? Could she have done something else? Could Adam have done something else? Well, of course they can. There's always another way. God provides other ways for us. You know, we don't have to talk about that person that way, even though it makes us feel good right then. Because there's a lot of other ways to feel good. Or we don't have to treat that person that way. We can have fun in other ways. We don't have to break promises or commitments in order to find some sense of relief. We can find relief in other ways. We don't... We don't have to do all kinds of things just to make ourselves feel a certain way. We can do those things in other ways. There's always another way. And God's trend and God's habit and God's promise is that God always provides another way for us. I love the memory verse that's for this week. It's this one. I love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And Moses said this in the book of Deuteronomy near the time when Moses was reminding them what the Ten Commandments are all about. And he's like he sums it up just as Jesus did with love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And God's way is to believe, is for us to believe that God has the best in mind for us. 
Uh, I've, I've learned that fruits and vegetables grow in different ways. Um, in fact, now is the time of year when all the nurseries have seed packets out because it's time to start germinating seeds indoors for when the weather warms up and we can start planting things like tomatoes or herbs or other things that you can plant from seeds. But what happens if we slice open our apple and we take those seeds out and we plant them and grow an apple tree? Is that an apple that anybody wants to eat? Evidently, well, okay, that's a nursery guy. <laughs> Oftentimes, the, the apples that grow from seeds are bitter, and they're, they're not the kind of apples that we buy in the stores. The apples that we buy in the stores and the apples that we usually like, they come from a grafted tree. And so we have to slice off a branch of a tree that we like, and we have to plug that into another tree so that we can grow the kind of apple that we love. We don't have a whole lot of hope on our own of growing up and having a great, fresh, sweet-tasting life. The best way is when we graft ourselves into the one who created this opportunity for the best life possible. That's saying yes to God every day we wake up. We can't say it once for all. We have to say it constantly because we are in this permanent condition where God provides another way. So my prayer is that we seize and we grab onto that other way that God continually provides for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray.